Anyway, I am uh, Gary Lawson. I am the Associate Dean for Intellectual Life here at Boston University School of Law. And about a dozen years ago, uh, when he held that post, uh, Jim Fleming over there started the marvelous tradition of honoring the publication of books uh, by members of the faculty. And today, uh, I am really, really happy uh, to be honoring uh, Anna de Robolance, The Making of Modern Property, Reinventing Roman Law in Europe and its Peripheries, 1789 to 1950. And if that sounds like a mouthful, it is, but as you'll see when uh, we start getting into our conversation, the, the, the book has enough substance to carry that mouthful. Uh, we'll, we're, we're really going to have a, 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 a wonderful time here uh, honoring Anna for this, uh, for this marvelous work. And to help us do that, uh, we are delighted to have uh, several of the preeminent property scholars in the country with us. Uh, at the far end is Professor K. Sue Park from UCLA School of Law. Uh, she was actually here a few years ago as part of our Barbara Jordan lecture series. Um, maybe people who were third years were here for that, I'm not sure. Uh, but if there are any of my current or former property students, if you think back to the very first day of class, I've got a PowerPoint slide about trees, that's Anna. And there's a PowerPoint slide about trains and train cars. That's from the article that Professor Park presented here uh, that was ultimately published in the Yale Law Journal. Uh, we are also delighted from uh, just a down slash up slash across the road, uh, Professor uh, Lua Kamal Yul, uh, Professor of Law and Business. And uh, I think she may be my counterpart because the title here is Associate Dean for Research and Interdisciplinary Education. Uh, what most schools uh, call the research dean. Uh, I guess in Boston, we like longer names for that. Uh, uh, she's at Northeastern University School of Law, uh, and we are thrilled to have them with us. Now, the format for these kinds of events is deliberately anarchic. Uh, they are very informal. These are not structured panels. These are conversations and celebrations, hence the food. So we're gonna have each of the panelists, and I have put myself on this panel for reasons you'll see when we come to me. Uh, each of our uh, panelists will talk for a few minutes. I've set 10 or 12 as a target. If it's a little under or a little over, we'll all get by. Uh, after we're done, uh, Anna will have a chance to reply, respond, or blush, depending upon what the three of us say. Uh, we'll have a little conversation, and then hopefully we'll hear from uh, from from you. Uh, so, with that said, I'm going to. We're just going to proceed in the, uh, I guess, in the order in which we are lined up. Uh, so, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Park. How's the sound? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Thanks for that introduction, Gary. Um, and thanks to Anna and, and Angela and everyone else who made it possible for me to come here for this event. I'm so thrilled to be here um, to congratulate Professor de Robillant on this massive achievement. So um, Professor Lawson said um, there's enough substance in this book to live up to that title. Um, there's much more in this book than the title even suggests. I have to say it is a sweeping intellectual history of how um, Europeans in the late 18th, early 19th, and through the 19th century, actually until the early 20th century, remade ideas of Roman law. But um, it, if you look closely at the sweeping intellectual history, it's actually made up of like a dozen sweeping intellectual histories put together, you know, like a Chuck Close painting. If you squint at it, it's so many other things um, inside and each component is just as rich and we could talk about that for days. Um, she grounds this all, for example, in an overview of Roman property law itself, um, a thousand years of the Republic, um, a, a major tradition. I mean, there's just so much that I learned from reading, from reading this book. Um, 
and a lot of it is in that particular chapter. You know, there are so many references to Roman law. And so um, she really goes back to the source and lays it all out to describe so many different parts of the tradition that either were or were not taken up by subsequent jurists. And that in itself is just a huge gift for all of us. This is a tradition that is invoked all the time, but submerged in the teaching of property law today. And this kind of um, comprehensive um, elucidation, she says, a simplification. How could it not be? It is a thousand years <laughs> of a legal tradition, um, but it's done so elegantly and so concisely, um, you know, and that's really what starts off the book. And that's um, just the beginning. This is just the background. She then goes to France. Um, she shows how the revolution impacted property law and how um, changes in property law were precipitated, obviously, by that seismic um, set of events um, and how theorists sort of struggled afterwards to, um, to find a new kind of property law that would fit a modern liberal order and reach to the Romanists. Again, in various ways, for various reasons, she goes to Germany to show um, how during a moment when the kind of um, competing old family estate system was crumbling, again, how jurists looked around and tried to think of a way to transition the country into, um, into a modern property state in conversation with the other states around it. So she shows these inter-European conversations. She shows us the sort of local impacts and intellectual traditions of Germany, of France, <laughs> building off of this tradition of the Romans. She takes us to Chile. She takes us to Mexico. She makes many references to Egyptian jurists. Um, so just the geography and the time span of this of this history, which is focused on ideas, um, again, an intellectual history, really on the theorizing of what property is, what property can be, what purposes it should serve, what purposes it will serve, um, all of that gets covered in this um, sort of massive, um, this massive geographical and historical span. And through this all, you really get a sense um, of what this tradition is becoming at a time where Europe is shifting from feudalist land holding traditions, um, you know, which she shows were um, really more in keeping with Roman ideas of divided dominium, multiple overlapping interests and in parcels of land at one time, um, to capitalism and how um, theorists idea of a unitary absolute form of dominium of ownership in particular facilitates that shift. Um, so there is this kind of incredible overarching um, this this arc that that serves as an umbrella for the whole thing that shows us that shift um, and how these kind of ideas about Roman law are um, kind of serving up the material and taking new form throughout this time. Um, I am not a scholar of the Roman law tradition, but I take it that one massive contribution of this text is to really um, show that a lot of what people have been saying about the Roman law tradition, what it contributed um, to our ideas about law today, were wrong. Um, that really these theorists were making up this idea of absolute dominium, um, really not completely out of whole cloth, but kind of out of whole cloth, like really from something that didn't exist in the Roman law tradition. Perhaps they were drawing it from elsewhere. Perhaps they were looking around to the material circumstances, the world around them and the needs of the changing um, proto to capitalist economy, um, but she shows that it did not come th from the Romans, and that seems to be a massive overhaul in the understanding of Roman law for those who uh, take up that question, are interested in that question, or are interested in having um, something more than a simplistic citation to scholarship that was interested, right, interested in the time of its production, um, and, um, you know, uh, sort of descendants of those interests today as they cite the Romans for the obviously um, authoritative kind of um, influence that they have over property law even still today. So that's one massive disruption. But also through it, she tells her own affirmative story of what is happening to property law. And so she really shows the tensions between this emerging concept of absolute unitary dominium um, versus pluralist um, forms, ideas about social property, the way that property must serve the collective and the way that different groups, communities, individuals, entities must share interests 
in land, in property, and the resources of a community at a given time. Um, and this is one point where I really have to especially thank you, um, Anna, because this is something I talk to my students about all the time. This is something, this is a tension that I think will probably be present in any property law system anywhere, is certainly present in ours, <clears throat> and is a <clears throat> focal point of my own class on property law. And I teach my students, really, I, I talk to them about how this is inevitable, how this is an inevitable tension. Um, and there are needs to, you know, because we live in a society that is where the absolute, um, where the absolute unitary idea of ownership is so strong and, and growing and changing all the time and becoming stronger, um, that the ways that we must share interests the ways that the law structures overlapping interests, um, shared usages, um, shared ownership, <clears throat> Is, is a necessary condition of having to live together and being a community um, and having to survive together and make decisions for the collective, even if um, this idea of absolute unitary dominium um, is often an obstacle to making decisions for the collective good in that way. Um, what you show us, Anna, in this history, which I appreciate so much, is that um, the same, not the same jurists, but in, within this community of people turning to the Romans for ideas about unitary absolute ownership, people are also turning to the Romans for the um, traditions that you illuminate in your overview of their law, um, of social property, of um, pluralist interests of the Roman ide uh, ideas about the law of things, about um, the kinds of laws that should govern different kinds of objects and materials and resources and even different kinds of lands based on their properties, their role in the community, their capacities, um, what lies within them rather than just sort of um, title ownership over the four co corners of an individualized parcel of land, um, all being interchangeable, fungible as they are in our economy. You show that the Roman law tradition was much richer and gave rise um, also to this set of ideas that the Romans were used for that as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, not only for socialist purposes, which, um, which was certainly one thing that it was used for, but also um, for capitalist purposes, because as the uh, economy was developing, there were needs to coordinate interests and uses that supported the market as well. And so um, a lot of changes that introduced those kinds of modernizing doctrines of shared interests, overlapping interests, um, were demanded by different kinds of market actors and by the state. Um, and that seems to me to be a very important thing to remember in our current world also that um, that this kind of distribution of interests and sharing of resources and coordination is also interest um, important for the market. And so it's not kind of a simplistic sort of unitary ownership versus <laughs> plurality, but it is what kind of plurality. Um, it is what groups interests, um, how, how, what sort of goals should we have in mind when we are structuring this regime? It's a much more complicated question and I appreciated that so much. Um, so the book puts forward very, very big questions that remain relevant to our time, as well as showing us what it meant to so many different nations um, at so many at such critical junctures and in their um, <clears throat> development as nations. And as we, it feels like we are at a turning point in so many ways where change is necessary, change must come. We are so unsustainable in so many ways facing challenges in the future. Um, this book holds lots of lessons um, um, and lots of warnings, I think, for us as we think about the role of property um, in facing that kind of future. Um, I have some questions. Is it better to ask them now or to hold them for the conversation? Uh, I'll make a note okay. now and then. I, and I, then I, I, I was going to do the same thing. I have a few. But... Okay, so I'll write them down and then yeah. I'll Okay, great. I can just include them in these. Ooh. <laughs> it feels like the volume is changing. Is that okay? I was at a steady before and then um, and then it got kind of wild. Okay. Um, so another uh, theme that runs through your entire book that I was so interested in um, is the Roman idea of law as a science. Um, 
a science uh, with sort of objective principles and um, and a goal of neutrality that can be mastered. And this is also something that gets taken up um, in the late 18th century, in the 19th century. It's not so hard to see why. Um, and it's not to say that you should have covered it because you cover so many things. I can't actually imagine you taking up another major thread to explore, but it was hard not to wonder um, what sort of the evolution of the sciences during that same period and sort of enlightenment ideas about sciences and objectivity and um, the ability to study the natural world and also the social world and um, and and humans and all of that um, how that was in conversation with these um, with these developments in law and the urge to turn to the Romans for that particular idea um, and adopt them as a kind of authority um, and then my other question had to do um, Sorry, I just can't help it because we're here in an American law school with the with the Anglo American tradition. Um, because obviously, you know, you say it at one point that the Romans are a very powerful ghost that people are reaching towards and um, and turning to. And I and um, and I loved that phrase, but it feels to me like the English tradition is also a bit of a ghost in this story. Um, there are many references to all these jurists across Europe. Um, and elsewhere reading Adam Smith, for example. Um, so Britain more accurately. But but you know, I just I wondered how that was playing into, you know, the turn towards absolute dominion. This is, after all, a period you're writing about, the period of change in Europe is the period sort of at the end of the enclosure movement, certainly the colonies are in full swing. And so um, especially when you um talk about contemporary property theorists like. Um, Marilyn Smith, for example, turning to these ideas of absolute dominium or even the Roman idea of the law of things. Um, I wondered how that comes in. I'm sure the English legal tradition has its own way of taking up Roman law concepts. And so it seems like that is one route through, but also since you are so attentive to looking at how these countries are sort of looking sideways at each other, competing with one another, sort of building up aspects of their own national jurisprudence um, in contrast to, you know, um, sort of pointing out the, the weaknesses of other countries, um, developing jurisprudence, what role England is playing here, because it would just seem that that is a very strong part of that legal tradition. In fact, you say that as the countries are trying to um, sort of develop a, a, a Latin tradition of jurisprudence based on the, the Romans, um, in contrast to the Anglo-Saxon tradition in which the individual is so paramount, individual interests are so paramount, um, it seems like that might also be a source of ideas about absolute dominion. And so I, I wondered um, what you thought about that, about that relationship. So I can't say enough positive things about this project, about this book, about its contributions. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Imagine that I said all of them. <laughs> because for 10 minutes, I want to I wanna share with you a little bit about what I plan uh, to do with, with this, this, this work um, and how I think it really speaks to the conversations that I'm having in my own work, but also uh, with my students. So imagine, I said all the good things and I mean them, sincerely. Um, uh, and, and so I start my property class um, and probably too many of my papers that talk about property um, <laughs> with a, a really you know similar set of themes. Which was number one, you already know a lot about property. That's, that's what I tell my students. We spend, we actually spend hours um, engaging just how much we know about property. So the first thing I, I, I really am going to have in my mind moving forward, and it's really based on reading um, uh, the making of modern property, is, yeah, maybe I do know a lot about property, and maybe everyone knows a lot about property, but we know a, lo a lot less than we think we do. And we know a lot less than we think we do because what we know about property is really embedded in a set of narratives and beliefs that have been transmitted into our, our cultural baseline about how we distribute valued resources. Um, and and it, it was really, you know, 
exciting and interesting to say, oh, wait, a lot of that myth is not just a myth, we don't necessarily like all the outcomes, but it's literally <laughs> a myth. And it was the project of myth making. And so having that trace as not an intuition that I sort of have in my stomach, uh, but being able to have that traced through historical documentary evidence uh, is exciting and important. For those of us who have a big question about the function of property systems. And so if I also travel with your that. Kids, yes, we are focused on an Anglo-American, specifically American property system, but we are understanding what we learn in property. What I am interested in in the conversation of property is not, you know, the rules of adverse possession or the rules of trespass, but how we have created this purportedly unified system for assigning power and authority and responsibility with respect to valued resources. Um, and, and there's themes that pop out at us. And they're very frequently intractable things, themes that suggest that property is about stability and that an economic system requires a stable set of rules around how we assign these valuable resources to function, right? That property right to use Bentham, it's the basis of expectations, right? And that we're sitting here and we're making these efficient decisions and assigning property in ways that make sense. And indeed, very frequently we're told it makes sense because that's just nature. It makes sense like a tree makes sense. And in reading this book it, it, on every page, you are reminded, and not just reminded, but it is traced for you clearly that property isn't natural. Property isn't about stability. Property isn't about expectations and efficient organization of economies. Property is a set of choices about power. Property assigns and reassigns and redesigns how power is going to function. And yes, this is embedded in a very broad geographic, but in a particular geographic moment, in particular tracing of time periods. But that is the perennial property question. It's not something that just falls to us as mana from heaven. It is first the set of who we want to have power. And so I love this idea, Romanist bourgeois property. Who do we want to have power? We were in a, we, I do the, the global we, which like, ah, not me. <laughs> but there was a specific set of decisions on who should have this power and authority, and then concessions over time, right? Concessions that actually lead to the property system being legitimized, right? And that's what's for me so interesting about, sorry, what's so interesting about the adoption selective, but the adoption of these Roman principles. That wasn't, we need this, this is natural, this is good. That was clearly legitimized. And these are conversations that a lot of us are having every day with our students, that a lot of us are trying to engage in our property scholarship. And to have that not just written down clearly, but to go so far back in time, right? The beginnings I, 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 I talk about in my work of property being the core technology of capitalism, right? And I actually was just the other day um, in a workshop on a on a project that I've been working on for a really long time um, and wish it was done, but you know how that is. Um, and there was this chicken and the egg conversation, right? Is property as we understand it as an institution, it, it predates capital. And I was like, yeah, but there's like some history there. And the core principles of capitalism are grafted in uh, property. And I said enough. And this book really says, okay, Hold on, let's see how that push and pull actually occurred. What the, the push and pull and how the push and pull impacted the, sorry about that, um, impacted the adoption and the development of property um, and of capital. So this is, this is really exciting because, you know, I, 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 I find myself very frequently saying, I don't have a lot of appetite left 
I don't have a lot of appetite left for these ideas about property not being able to be changed. That property is this sticky and intractable system that's not amenable to change when we see that property is always changing and that indeed the property that we know today was again this self-conscious project to assign power in certain ways in light of politics and evolution of other political systems. So this is exciting, this is fun. In a little bit, it, it, it is a bad thing that I love this book so much because I love it so much because it really empowers me to have much more robust uh, and intelligent and supported conversations about a lot of things that I let live in the world of my intuition or live in the world of, I'm not a historian, and therefore history black box. Uh, and it and it and it really opens that up for us. Um, I also wonder and want to know more um, about the direct connections um, between the Anglo-American development of property and this Roman evolution. Uh, but I have a different that I want to put on the table, um, and this is one that um, I think is really versus our property that is. And uh, I lived for many years um, in Italy and in my own you know, property projects over time have, have always wanted to say, hey, look, I have a very um, close connection to what I believe is the property orientation of the United States writ large. We have property communities. So we have property cultures, but like United States writ large, I have a clear idea of what our property culture is and how that is manifest in our current settlements or orientations around property questions. Um, and I wonder whether this, in some ways, historiography rather than just intellectual history, uh, whether this historiography stands in tension with what we might choose any of the four uh, European, again, cultures, because even within any given country, especially given the time periods that you cover, we've got competing cultures. It's not an Italy. There are Italy's um, over, over history and then even in time, but whether and to what extent this historiography, this re-understanding uh, of how property came to be, um, does it, would it sit in tension with what you what you might imagine to be the contemporary culture of property, um, in terms of people on the street, right? How people live and experience property. A lot of times when I'm doing my work, um, I I I have to to strike this balance between this is what I think property is, this is what property does, this is how property came to be, and what people think on the street, right? Possession is nine tenths of the law. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers, just, you know, those common American sayings. And then we're like, hey, look, that's property as culture. This is what property law is. And so I'm wondering how these revelations um, maybe are reflected or not reflected um, in the property cultures of all, uh, because again, you deal with a lot and it's, it's, it's a really expansive, in depth, while also totally manageable, right? Which is which is which is which is really appreciated. Like I'm able to go in with my normal understanding of basic European history, which those of us who are educated in an Anglo-American system will have access to, and follow the stories that you write, which is just a feat in and of itself, right? Like how do you do so much in a reasonable amount of space and keep me reading to the end? That is a triumph um, in and of itself. Um, but I really am excited to see this, this particular work become a slide with a tree, um, but really become, you know, de rigor for understanding property because, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, I know a lot about property. And then I remember uh, reading the making of Pro modern property and saying, oh, wait, <laughs> oh, wait, I'm going to put an asterisk on that when I say it and when I teach that to my students. Those are my reflections, thank you.
All right, I, I put myself on the panel in addition to, to being the moderator. Um, probably a mistake. Um, I, uh, I embarrassed Anna uh, in, unintentionally yesterday uh, when I sent out a reminder email to the faculty uh, about a program for this, and I used the word magisterial book. And it wasn't something that I thought through carefully. I just sat there and I typed it out and, and, and out it went. Uh, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by that. As, as Professor Park said, and I, I actually have it written down and I wrote it down before she said, it's sweeping intellectual history. Understand what this book does. This book sweeps as intellectual history across two centuries, about a dozen countries on three continents. In order to pull all of this material together, I just jotted down a stream of consciousness, the, the kinds of expertise that one would need in order to make this happen. One would have to be not an exhaustive list, an historian, an economist, political scientist, political theorist, comparativist, sociologist, property theorist, and of course, Roman law specialist. Now I go 0 for 8 on those. Uh, I, I, I do not consider myself a property theorist. I, I just teach the course as an old school uh, doctrinalist. So what would I possibly have to say about a book of this sophistication and scope? Well, here's, here's the best I can do. Uh, the thing that's, that's remarkable about this work is not just the amazing erudition that went into it. Uh, it's one of the most impressive just pieces of scholarship I've ever encountered. Uh, it's, it's almost universal in its application. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, Anna has a specific program in mind in doing this. And, and, and it's, it's explicit. It's not implicit. It's, it's actually in the book on, on page 324, where she's asking, it says, most importantly, the conclusion, is there any tool in this tradition that holds promise for a transformative property agenda in line with the values of democratic equality and sustainability? In other words, it is, is explicitly uh, driven uh, by a, a progressivist project. My point to you today is that this is an invaluable work, an invaluable work, even to those of us who would call ourselves regressive. Um, I've, uh, I've hung around uh, in, in libertarian circles for, for half a century. Um, and I, I think this is required reading uh, for anyone in my cohort. Let's just suppose, hypothetically, hypothetically, that you have a, um, a hardcore libertarian uh, who would make the physiocrats uh, that are discussed in Anna's book in several places uh, look like communists. All right, according to this view, uh, property uh, really is uh, uh, grounded in objective moral truths and can be deduced as a matter of natural law from an ethic of uh, individual moral individualism. Okay, suppose all of that is so. What, what does any of that actually get you? Uh, could you deduce from that high-level theory um, granular rules about how to structure any kind of property regime? Would it tell you how to identify what units of property are? Uh, will it tell you what the conceptual boundaries of any particular item of property are? Will it tell you what remedies to provide to possessors who can't trace their title according to the first principles of title in definitive fashion? Will it tell you what counts as possession of any particular item? Now, again, having hung around with libertarians for half a century, um, a lot of them assume that the answer is yes, that, that you can have these, these grand rhetorical principles and simply deduce from them the contours of an entire property structure. That is precisely the mistake that a good portion of Anna's book warns against. 
That was the project of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century theorists that she described who tried to construct an entire code of property out of a simplified notion of Roman law dominium. And it just didn't work. And it can't work conceptually. It is impossible for it to work. And the way to see that it's impossible for that to work is, is, is to focus on what Anna calls the two key principles that she thinks are not obvious from what she says in her 300 plus pages, but what, what she hopes people draw out. And that is the notion of divided ownership in contrast to the unitary uh, dominium that formed the basis for the Romanist project and property as the law of things. What do we, what do we mean by any of that? Well, what Anna means by divided ownership, and we can divide ownership across time, across persons, across assets. What she says is it shows the, that the relational nature of property is, is something that is unavoidable. Property is not a relation between people and things. Property is a relationship among people uh, with respect uh, to things, ideas, or whatever. And that is absolutely true. As a wise property theorist wrote I think very recently, within the last year or two, um, you wouldn't have property on a desert island. Uh, Professor Ewell, didn't one of your articles start with that observation? I think I, think I took that observation from you. I was you. like, that sounds good. Yeah, well, I think that's what you said. I mean, that's, and that's true. I mean, no, this, it, it, she has an article on that. There, there's a certain conceptual foundation for the, for the very idea of property, right? Um, you, you only have the concept of property arising when you have issues of social coordination. If it's just you on a desert island, you have things, you have you, uh, but what you don't really have is the concept of property. So because property is a concept necessarily presupposes coordination among discrete after, uh, actors, uh, yeah, there is a conceptual point that any property theory has to be relational. And that's true whether it's a progressive theory, a regressive theory, an expressive theory, or any other kind of if theory that you want to come up with. It's a universal point that is fundamental to thinking about the nature of property. Her second point, that property is the law of things, uh, is also uh, universal. And, 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 and here is where, here's where the tree PowerPoint uh, from my course comes in. Uh, property rules at the granular level of doctrine. And again, this is not something unique to the United States legal system. This is something one could generalize about at the granular level of doctrine uh, are gonna be specific, not universal. Um, and that's true, I think, without regard to what the substantive commitments are that form the basis for the property system. Uh, are, are you likely to have the same kinds of property rules for water uh, as you have for paper plates? Just, I mean, it, 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 it's not obvious that you're going to have universal rules that are applying regardless of the nature of the item. Uh, is there, in fact, a single unitary rule for water? Is there a single right rule? Can you deduce from natural law uh, whether or not the appropriation or riparian uh, 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 system of water rights makes the most sense? Uh, you're going to have the same rule. My students will love this one. You're going to have the same rules for possession of a wild fox as you are for possession of a sunken shipwreck. Just, just, is that, that universal or is that something that has to be tailored to the nature of the context that you're dealing with? Can you logically derive any of these kinds of granular answers from a natural rights theory, even if one believes, as I regressively do, uh, that, that that theory is true? Uh, I think the answer is obviously no. And what that means is that Anna's book, regardless of what her program may or may not have been, is a formula for careful thinking about property regardless, regardless of what kind of property system you will ultimately construct. Uh, now, what's interesting, and this came up in some of the questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to pose one of mine, and then I've got a couple more in reserve. 
Uh, but one of mine actually comes out of some things uh, that uh, Professors Park and Ewell also, uh, also wanted to, uh, to talk about. Uh, and that is, I mean, the United States doctrinal law doesn't seem to have the kinds of problems uh, that the Europeans had. Uh, the kind of conceptual moves that the Europeans worried about so much. And uh, just, just wondering, speculating about why that might be so. Uh, so let me, let me end my, uh, uh, with, with this question. H how much of that is a function of two things that are not necessarily true in, in Europe or Latin America. But by the way, it's not just a book about Europe. This is also a book about Latin America. Mexico plays a big part in this story. Chile plays a big part in this story. I mean, as I say, it covers three continents. There's a lot going on here. What all of those countries have in common is they're civil law countries. Uh, they're not common law countries. And I just wonder how much of the development that she's describing in those areas is a function of the fact that it is, it is a civil law structure where property law comes from a constitution-like code rather than a dispersed and in a federalist structure geographically and legally dispersed system where you don't necessarily expect to find unitary rules governing everything. In other words, is, is the United States common law system better suited to the kind of structures that Anna has in mind than the European and Latin American civil law structures would be. Is this a more fertile ground for her than she will find in her native land? Uh, and with that, I will let her uh, have her say, and we'll go from there. Can you hear me? Um, okay, <laughs> thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm immensely honored. It's the biggest gift to have in this room, Keisu Park and Lua Yu. Um, they're two of the two younger, um, extremely creative and sophisticated property scholars who do work in a tradition that is different than mine and have really inspired my work in so many ways. My many property students who are in here, thank you, uh, start their property class with an article on uh, property and race and the erasure of race in property textbooks in the US written by, um, by Professor K. Sue Park, who has really changed my way of, uh, teaching, uh, of teaching property and thinking about property in many ways. Um, and, um, and I've been a huge admirer of Professor Lua Yu's uh, work that is so focused on a critique of um, white androcentric. Uh, okay, a white androcentric property. And her article, um, What If Property Was a Black, what Were a Black Woman, is, is an extremely inspiring. Uh, so it's a huge honor, the biggest gift um, to have you here today to talk ab about my book. I'm also immensely grateful to all of you. I'm immensely grateful to my dean, Angela, um, for supporting me through all these years. Um, I'm immensely grateful to the many colleagues who, wrote, who uh, read draft after draft. Um, I'm very grateful to the library. Stephanie Whiteman and Ron Wheeler did an amazing work. I wouldn't have been able to write this book without Stephanie Whiteman. So thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you, Gary, for being such a generous colleague over the years. We'll miss you a lot. And thank you for organizing this beautiful event today. Um, so, um, okay, let me take the questions in, um, in order. So first of all, um, a point that I think responds in, uh, to both, um, clarifies what both um, Professor K. Sue Park and, uh, and uh, Professor Lawson mentioned about this being um, 
the agenda and the, and the perspective from which this history, this intellectual history is written is made very clear. This is in a way, it's an intellectual history, but it's, I'm very explicit and transparent about, um, about the, uh, the ultimate agenda, right? Uh, obviously, Roman law, any reconstruction, any account of Roman law today is gonna be partial, anachronistic, contingent, and ideological, right? Roman law has been used as a weapon over the years, as a, as a sort of rhetorical, uh, a powerful rhetorical weapon for such different agendas that um, I made it very clear from the beginning that my Roman law chapter where I focus on five doctrines, it's obviously anachronistic, it's obviously written with a specific agenda in mind. And it's, it has no pretension to be a universally valid and true account of Roman law. I would not even say, is there a true Roman law, right? Roman law is an extremely malleable vocabulary that has been given different content, a different co content at different times. Um, and so my, you know, the, the sort of democratic, um, the egalitarian democratic perspective, tradition of progressive property from which, uh, from which I write. I wanted to make that uh, very clear. Um, the, um, so all your questions are fabulous. Um, and I've, they've been real, like, they've presented real challenges over uh, the eight years in which I wrote this book. Um, I'll start with the question about science, right? Um, this aspiration, Roman law was presented as a science, was presented as a science, and, and that was part, one of the many things that made Roman law so attractive, so appealing, at a time in which late, late uh, early 19th century and late uh, 18th century, people were enlightenment liberal Europe on the, on the road to, to a capitalist liberal society was enchanted with science. It was the moment of positivism. It was the moment of um, huge, huge progress in the natural sciences, in mathematics, in geometry. And the, the jurists were, were very aware of all of this and I was surprised by the number of references to uh, scientific change and scientific innovation that, for example, French jurists had, right? Now, of course, the type of science that jurists appealed to changed regionally, for example, which is another, the, the tension between a universal property and the, the local regional needs is, is another big theme in the story, right? So the French were very much appealing to the, the idea of science as biology, as the natural sciences. Um, the Germans were appealing to the science of government, social science and the science of, of government. Um, and then, of course, mathematics. Um, so the type of science changed, but the appeal of science and the idea that obviously science, it, science is, is again a, a, an important, the claim to science is, is an important rhetorical, rhetorical tool. Um, so yes, they were enamored with, with science. And um, um, you know, I have some nice quotes about science, for example, uh, in the um, preparatory works for the, uh, the Code Napoleon, the book on property, um, the idea that um, law, the science of law is the experimental physics of legislation. And then the Germans, Roman law, Roman legal science as a form of geometry. So this used the scientism and sort of uh, Jurists being enamored with science was something that um, was, to me, very, uh, was really fascinating. And, and obviously, again, science is an ideological tool. Um, the, um, 
the second question, um, the second question that both both um, uh, Professor Kesu Park and 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 Gary uh, posed uh, the differences between the Romanist tradition between the the. the property culture, the Romanist bourgeois property tradition that I'm describing in the book, and Anglo-American property law. Are they so different? Where I approach the story uh, initially, the research, I would say, with the idea that, yes, they, were, they are so different. This is what I was taught. This is why, what I was taught in law school. They're so different. In fact, there's no other field of law in which the civil law and the, and the common law differ so much as property. But ultimately, I think my book is really an attempt to show that they're not different at all, that the fundamental intuitions are very similar. There are not many traces of direct communications, of direct intellectual dialogue between Anglo-American jurists and, and continental European or Latin American jurists. But the ideas and intuitions are obviously part of a larger repertory that is that is circulating globally. So, for example, uh, absolute dominium. Um, well, Blackstonian, what in the U.S. is described as Blackstonian property, is is very Roman. It's deeply Roman. It's not so different from absolute dominium. In fact, it's more sophisticated than than absolute dominion, but it's the same intuition. So that intuition about absolute property was, was there. Then another, another uh, tourism about uh, the Romanist bourgeois uh, tradition, we didn't have legal realism. In Europe, there was no legal realism. There was no Hofeld in Europe. Well, again, that's not true, because the same intuitions that Hofeld uh, emphasized in, um, in the US and that the legal realists pick up were in fact already inherent in, in medieval property. The idea of relation, that property is relational, that property is about social relations, uh, the idea of divided dominion, it, it was some of the same intuitions. And today, today the, um, you know, there's so much, um, it's it's paradoxically a moment in which the Romanist bourgeois tradition seems so powerful in American academia, right? With um, um, uh, Henry Smith writing about about the right to exclude and dominion, with Larissa Katz writing about abuse of rights, Gregory Alexander about the social obligation. So, um, Roman inspired or Romanist bourgeois concepts have never been so present and so powerful in the, the property debate as today in the US. Um, and um, um, Gary's point, and then I'll stop and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I wanna hear from you, but uh, Gary's point about uh, the point of the book is that it shows that absolute dominion is impossible and any aspiration to a universal, robust, absolute idea of property from which you deduce granular rule is, is an illusion. Um, yes, when I ended the book, I was left with the idea that centuries and centuries of property debates were a waste of time. With absolute dominion, people claiming something that is obviously impossible, <laughs> property cannot be absolute. And, and on the other hand, the social critics of absolute property claiming something that is obvious. Of course, property is a social relation. Do we need two centuries of, and rivers of ink in, on, in both continents, in three continents, to say that property cannot be absolute and that, and that actually property is a social relation? Yes, th it, that's exactly where, in fact, I do say it, that at the end of, of the... Um, of the um, of the conclusions, um, yeah. I think I'll I'll stop here and take. I, I was looking for the, the, the exact <laughs> phrase "waste of time" is in there somewhere. I was trying I was trying to find it, yes. but I uh, I can't I can't pinpoint it. But that, those exact words. Uh, let me give our other uh, panelists a chance to uh, engage in colloquy before we turn it over to the uh, audience for questions. If anyone wants to 
add additional thoughts, or shall we just go straight to, uh, to the folks out there? Just in response to what you were just saying, Anna, I think, um, I think you're selling <laughs> your work short. Uh, reading this book and, and listening to you talk, but especially reading this book, one thing that it really made me think about, especially your overview um, of the Roman law of property, you know, you say that you're, you clearly have an interest and um, don't claim that this is the only story and, and so forth, and I appreciate that, of course. However, <laughs> however, the information you put forth is so different from the prevailing account, as you describe it, and as I understand it in our world today, that you do make certain things irrefutable, right? You make certain, certain um, understandings of how the Romans shared interest reserved interests for public purposes, for sacred purposes, for community purposes, um, irrefutable. I mean, I don't think anyone is saying that those things didn't happen, and that is already so different from the kind of world we have today, where the sort of modern conceptions of property that you show taking shape in the first place have taken hold and are just the norm almost everywhere now, um, that it is really astonishing to read that chapter and see the different ways that people um, were using land, were using things, even the way that you begin that chapter by saying, um, there is no definition of property. You know, that is just incredible, that there's no definition of what property is, that there is a law of things and lots of different things are described in order to allocate different use rights and ownership rights and different um, kinds of access or not by different entities, that already is just incredible. And it really makes us remember um, that the role of property in structuring our collective life is quite different today than it was then. And so this is a question, I mean, I just have a bit of a one-track mind, but a thing I think about all the time is the preeminent place of property in our economy, right? It wasn't always the case that land was the most valuable commodity, you know, that our homes were the most commodified, kind of single most valuable asset um, that anyone has or has a relationship to. And your chapter reminds us that there were lots of different ways your chapters remind us that um, a lot went into transforming these things. And it, they also remind us that the theorists who were developing some of these new conceptions could not foresee where they would go, right? They were moving out of the feudal system and into something different. They were trying to facilitate a free market, you know, or compromise with old landholders, as the case might be. You know, you show the great variation and the different strategies to move into a different kind of world. But um, the sort of world I just described, where property is so preeminent and controls everything, especially landed interests and interest derivative of land, <laughs> and then other kinds of, um, you have great language for it, but I've already forgotten, you know kind of conceptual interests that are not even grounded in material reality. Um, these interests loom so large and comprise so much wealth. It's, it's a completely different world. So anyway, it's just to say that I don't think that this is a useless exercise. Thinking about what absolute dominion means across any of these scenarios, if the Romans didn't have it, why didn't they have it? If different kinds of nations in Europe were trying to take it up. Why were they trying to take it up? For what purpose? But what does such a form of absolute dominium do in our context where property itself is, is, is simply a different, <laughs> is a different kind of thing and structures our relations really, really differently already? You give us, um, you give us the frameworks that we need for thinking about that question, which seems to me to be so important. And um, I, you know, I'm also a historian because I don't know a better way to show that um, for most of time, <laughs> everywhere in the world, people, people had very different conceptions, even if they use some of the same language, the relationships, the material conditions of life were so different um, that those property concepts operated very differently. And so by giving us this survey with so many different contexts, I think that is probably the point I take away more than any other from this book. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, the Roman law chapter is the one that took me probably three years. I had to reteach myself Roman law, to reteach myself Latin and be able to 
to translate these texts. Of course, I had research assistants helping me, but um, it was the most difficult, not only because of the technicalities, but also because, and this is, is something that I mentioned in the book at several times, because Romanists, experts in Roman law, are so attached to their discipline and to their narrative. And so the idea that an outsider, someone who is not professionally trained as a Roman lawyer, uh, and that teaches in the US, would now provide an account in one chapter, in one chapter of Roman law, is something that was really, really tricky and difficult to do. My, read, my, my external reviewers at Cambridge University Press included European Romanists. And I had to be very careful with accuracy, the vocabulary, and make choices between what, you know, can I, I want to write an accessible book, but at the same time, I don't want to displease uh, the, the geeky, um, very possessive Romanist who, who is attached to their, um, to their framework. Um, so um, I focused on, on, uh, on doctrines and forms of property that uh, made, that now in, in today's perspective and looking at, at what happened in property and how property developed seem to have, to me, to have proven most impactful and consequential. Um, the, um, There were so, so many things that were surprising. Um, I approached the book with so many, in a way, as a, as a part believer in absolute dominion and social, and the social critique, I thought there was something to it. And then when I found out that there was no definition of dominion anywhere, that the whole enterprise of defining dominium started centuries later, and there were at least five possible different definitions of dominium, and none was authentic, and all of them, of course, interpolation of Roman texts is another big problem, problem right? So what was original? But everything became so, so confusing. Um, there, were, there wasn't a definition of dominium, but there were all these other things that are we rarely think about uh, when, when we think about, about property, right? So the plurality of property forms, divided dominium, the lex agraria, all these ideas, which is nothing other than an agrarian law, a redistributive land, form of land reform and redistribution. Um, those were the pieces that to me seemed like the real story not this, this vague idea of, of impossible, uh, absolute dominion. Um, as I was answering um, in my brief remarks, I didn't address a wonderful question that um, uh, Professor Euler posed, which is how, how similar or different are um, property cultures today? in the US and, and in Europe, right? The understanding of property on the ground, but also the, the activist understanding of property by reformers and social movements. Again, I think they're very similar. Just as historically, there's no huge difference between the ideas and the central intuitions in Anglo-American property and in, in uh, property that is derived from Roman law, so today. Unfortunately, the idea that property is a robust right and absolute dominion is still pervasive to this day on, for, for people in, 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 in our daily, in popular culture, property is property. On the other hand, we all recognize that property is about things, that property is about resources, that property, that, that uh, the law of water and the law of paper plates, as Gary was saying, is obviously <laughs> different, right? So that's another intuition that is, is obviously we all have on the ground. So the way we think about property is a tension between social and individualistic is, is is now common, it's part of, of our property culture these days. 
um, the law reform movement, the activist agenda for a democratic and egalitarian property law is also converging, is also organized around a set of common ideas, right? For example, uh, the commons, the commons, the urban commons, the land commons are a huge, uh, um, you know, element in the progressive democratic egalitarian agenda. In the US where, for example, Sheila Foster um, writes wonderful work about, about the commons and in Europe where actually there are experiments on the ground with the commons as a way to make uh, resources um, accessible and as a way to uh, involve um, um, citizens in governance, right? So clearly the commons are a direction where reform agendas um, uh, are, uh, are converging. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, both historically and in the, in the present, there's a lot that is, that is common. I don't believe any of the, the, the mythology of the, the rigid separation between the two systems. And Gary, right. I, I want to write a, yeah. I want to write an article called the law of paper plates. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> Uh, but I want to I want to have it known here that I will credit Gary for the title, but it's mine. Okay. <laughs> All right. We've got some hands already. David Seit, by tradition, asks the first question. Do we have a microphone that circulates? There we go. Elizabeth has that. Is that on? Is this on? Yes, it is. Um, well, I thought a medievalist geek should answer, ask a question about that. Well, I don't, huh. do I have a question? I have a defense of the Roman chapter. Um, uh, I know a little bit about Roman law, and I know one thing. It is incredibly messy, just intensely complicated. To inhabit the, Ro the ancient Roman legal system would take a lifetime, and you'd still not, even with the text we have and limited text we have, get anywhere near what was real about it. I know of one very important thing, that legal history is simplification that intellectual history is, is, is simplification, vast simplification. That teaching is simplification. When you come down to it, teaching is simplification. Um, so um, the, you caught these modern bourgeois, Roman bourgeois, modern European property lawyers um, vastly oversimplifying the ancient Roman texts and saying, this is the truth. And, and you, you, you point that out beautifully. Um, um, Everybody is going to simplify differently. They're all simplifiers. We're all simplifiers. Uh, some of us are doing it well. Some of us are doing it badly. And nobody is wrong. The, the underlying history, if you're taking Ang medieval Anglo-American law, medieval English law, it is incredibly overcomplicated. And everything I say about it is a simplification. I know that. And I own that. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm the right simplification. But getting a new simplification that says the older simplifications were cheating is a wonderful achievement, and I thank you for it. I don't know if you have any any <laughs> comments about that, but I leave that to thank the next you person. so much. I would, you know, yes, uh, every every intellectual history, every intellectual legal history is a simplification, and is a simplification. I would say again, with that is contingent, anachronistic, and with an agenda, and I think we have to be very honest about that. My jurist in the book had agendas, so many different agendas, and I have one in telling their, their story. All right, my cue right now is Professor Sugarman and Professor Feingold, but any student can bump both of them. <laughs> no takers? Okay. I, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry for bumping. Um, just a quick question. Obviously, uh, history and position, the work of an intellectual history traces the placement of the ideas and, and their conditions to flourish. Is there anything about the modern context of, of either the legal system or the current economic conditions or the current economic system that you think makes you optimistic or pessimistic about change relative to history? Or do you, so do you think that the interconnectedness is a, is a positive boon for the connection of ideas? Or do you think it's only becoming more difficult to achieve some kind of like large-scale property reconceptualization? Um, that's a great question. Um, I end the book, the conclusions with a 
sort of pessimistic note, right? And the pessimistic note is if we are looking for um, tools that would help us reconceptualize property for a democratic egalitarian agenda in the Romanist bourgeois tradition, well, there's not much that we can use, right? What could be used has already been, been sort of retrieved and reinvented, but it hasn't proven, it worked as a mild corrective. It hasn't proven that, that effective and consequential, right? Ultimately, the legacy of the social critics is, is very mixed. So uh, besides the idea that property is relational and the idea that property is contextual, purposive, um, resource-based reasoning, craftsmanship, um, I'm not sure there's, there's much to, to rely on. Um, the challenge, I think, the, ch the challenge for something Reconceptualizing property in a creative way, yes, that is the challenge on the table. It has already been, you know, it's a challenge that several, that various generations in the past have tried to pick up, but uh, I'm not, I'm not optimistic, honestly. Can I disagree I, with you on your own book? Yeah. I, I, I actually think one of the major contributions of understanding that it's a bunch of choices creates space for folks who want to sit down and make different choices to have that opportunity. Now, I'm a pessimist, so like, do we have the political will and things like that? That's a different question, but very frequently, and think about a lot of property conversations that you have both in law and outside of law, they are framed as if those aren't options because we are, and I'm gonna borrow inappropriately numerous clauses, right? We are closed, it is a closed system, this is the thing, how do we make it work for today? Versus, hey look, we remade the system and we keep remaking the system. So I think your contribution, and it doesn't matter, right? Like I loved, Gary was like, it doesn't matter if you're coming from, for example, a libertarian tradition or a progressive tradition, what you're creating is an opportunity to not just think carefully about property, but make property thoughtfully and actively. Um, and it opens more space for that. Well, because of classes, we do have a hard deadline of two o'clock. So I'm gonna have to cut off two of my colleagues because there are a few parting observations I have to make. First, please join me once again in thanking all of our panelists and Anna. <laughs> not done. I also want to thank the, in the indispensable Elizabeth Clancy, who always makes these things possible. And I don't know if Noah Chase. Yeah. This is, a, this, this is called a loss in lunch. This is called a loss in lunch. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we are formally adjourned. Oh, I